Hello everybody, welcome to Richard's Trainwreck Film Review. I am your host and Trainwreck, Richard, and today we're going to be talking about the 2021 film, The Green Knight. Uh, this is written and directed by David Lowry. It is an adaptation slash modernization slash soft reboot of the original chivalric romance of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, which was penned by an anonymous author. Is it Gawain? Is it Gawain? I've always said Gawain. Uh, that's how I learned it back when I was in college. Uh, if I'm saying it wrong, I don't really care because I'm not going to say Gawain. That makes me think of, like Gawain's world, and I can't, I can't bring myself to picture Mike Myers and Dana Carvey in this movie. So I'm just going to say Gollum. Oh, I've also got my little green Oliver mug here, appropriate for the occasion. Yes, I have two mugs with my cat. I'm not a fucking loser. Anyway, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. Um, this was a film I had to watch a second time. I watched it the weekend it came out, and I instantly fell in love with all of the technical aspects of this film. Uh, everything from the cinematography to the lighting, the shot composition, and the, uh, the very haunting and unique score. It kind of reminded me of uh, another A24 film, The Witch. Uh, I don't believe this was composed by Mark Corvin. Uh, pretty sure Mark Corvin's the one who did the, the score for The Witch. But it, it has like a kind of a similar tone to it in a lot of spots. This isn't a horror film by any means, but it does dive into a, a lot of kind of horrifying themes and, and different subject matters uh, that are all kind of like present in the original poem. And the reason I wanted to watch it a second time was really just to kind of like suss out how I felt about the changes that were made to the original story, uh, because I thought they were interesting changes, but I had to go back and kind of make sure like, okay, do these changes add up? Uh, do they uh, actually like come to a meaningful conclusion or are they just there, you know, for like postmodern shock value or and, and I'm quite pleased to say that uh, when I walked out of the theater yesterday, I thought to myself, this might be my new favorite Christmas movie ever, uh, <laughs> which is kind of a, a little bit of a weird thing to say, but we'll, we'll get there in a moment. All right. So for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, the original story, the, the setup basically goes like this. Um, one year, Christmas time, uh, King Arthur and all the knights of the round table are gathered at his court in Camelot. And Arthur's like, hey, want to hear a story? A bard, tell me a story. That's not exactly what he said. I'm kind of paraphrasing here a little bit. Uh, but he wants to hear a, a story of daring and bravery and boldness. And uh, just before anybody can get up to tell a story of their, their conquests, uh, the door barges open and this massive, like, nine-foot-tall green knight this monster of a man comes in and it's like hey I'd like to play a little game yeah you think jigsaw came up with the the saw movies on his own no he was reading 14th century british literature get it right people anyway uh the green knight comes in and it's like here's how this game's gonna work i got this really dope axe here look at it it's dope it's big it's green it's made of stone or something uh if any of you could come up here and land a swing on me I'm going to give you this axe, and it's yours, on the condition that in one year's time, you got to come up to my green chapel, which is just to the north of here. We run a lovely bed and breakfast, and we serve a delicious eggs benedict in the morning. Uh, and when you get there, I'm going to give it to you as good as you gave it to me. Uh, <laughs> sounding a little gay at the outset, actually. There is a homoerotic undertone to the original poem and to this movie. That, that I kind of love. Um, <laughs> there's something about, like, repressed men uh, not wanting to admit that they're gay that <laughs> just really, uh, I think, is really quite hilarious. And th this film kind of taps into that a little bit. There was a moment towards the end of this film. I, I saw this with my father the second time around, which was not a, a great choice. He ended up liking it, but he's he's so fucking loud. And at one point at the end, this, this dude kisses Gawain, and I shit you not, in the middle of the theater, my dad went, huh? He gay. <laughs> and it took fucking everything I had not to just 
bust out laughing in front of the whole theater. Um, it was really, it was great. It, it kind of helped make the experience. But um, anyway, so the Green Knight is like, who's man enough? Who wants to take me on? And at first, nobody wants to do it. In the original story, Arthur's about to take the challenge because he sees nobody else is going to do it. But in the film, Arthur's like an old and frail man. Uh, and doesn't have the strength or the wherewithal to rise to meet the Knight's challenge anymore. Uh, and his performance, uh, Arthur's uh, characterization in this film was something I found rather interesting because uh, he's old and he's withered, which uh, speaks to a, a sort of rot and decay in the heart of Camelot, uh, and also kind of ties into the film's deconstruction of the chivalric code as a like a false code of honor that's used to justify death and bloodshed on a massive scale uh and and that's a kind of a, an undercurrent that runs throughout uh the entirety of the poem i can't really speak as to how much it's there in the original the original i haven't read in many years I, I, just kind of going off of memory when i talk of that one um, but it's done quite elegantly here, and uh, and despite all that, there's a, a nice contrast to Arthur's characterization, where even though it, it's apparent that uh, his uh, you know his hands are, are drenched with blood, both the uh, you know blood that he spilled as well as the blood that his knights have spilled across the land, uh, he still is portrayed with real warmth and tenderness and, and gentleness by the, 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 the gentleman who plays Arthur. I, I can't remember his name. I feel like I saw him in Game of Thrones. Uh, I'm sure it'll, it'll, it'll come to me at some point, probably in like three days. I remember. I guess I could look it up online, but I'm not going to do that because this is the train wreck film review. Okay, we're not here to keep the train on tracks. We're here for it to go careening wildly off into the distance, wherever that may take us. Anyway, in both versions of the story, uh, Gawain decides that he's going to be the one who's man enough to rise up and meet the challenge. And he shing, cuts the knight's head clean off to which the knight picks his head up off the floor and is like, see you to you, no gives these back to these, ha ha ha, and he runs off into the night. Uh, there's a great moment in this film, like, after the knight leaves, when the whole court just, like, erupts at applause. Yeah, you are so brave! And Gawain's got this thousand-yard stare of Oh my God, what have I fucking done? I have bitten off way more than I could chew. And I always thought it was kind of funny that he just went straight for the head. Because, yeah, the knight does offer up his neck. But, like, come on, dude. You, you couldn't have seen through that? Like, if I were going in that situation, I would have just, like, nipped the guy on, like, the arm or something and been like, okay, see you in a year, buddy. Uh, that probably would have been the clever response, but may not have necessarily been the knightly response. Which is why I work a desk job and I'm not a knight. Uh, some other interesting changes to this film are that... Uh, so in the original story, and and look, from this point on, we're just going to get deep into spoiler territory. If you're not interested in that uh, and you want to experience the film as fresh as possible, then just stop here and, and don't listen to me. Uh but if you don't mind, or if you like want some clarity on what happened in the film, then just listen, and I'm going to ramble a little bit, and, and we'll see where this goes. Anyway, in the original film, it's revealed at the end that the whole thing with Green Knight was a ploy by Morgan, Arthur's sister, uh, to, uh, I can't remember if it was uh, to either call out the cowardice of his, his knights, knowing that nobody would write to meet the Green Knight's challenge, or if it was like, uh, I think it might have been like her trying to scare Arthur's wife to death um, when she saw the Green Knight, that she would just die from shock. And in this, it's rewritten a little bit so that um, Morgan is actually Gawain's mother uh, in this film. And there's this wonderful like cross-cut like montage early in the film that cuts between uh, what's happening at the round table and what's happening in, like, this incantation that Morgan is performing um, to a... Oh, boy. Am I going to see? I'm cool. Anyway, um, so there's this wonderful cross-cut montage between, like, you know where Morgan is, like, reciting this incantation and all the things that she's saying are being repeated 
by people in the court, whether that's Arthur or somebody else. And uh, I get the impression that this whole journey is really kind of like an elaborate ploy by Gawain's mother to get him off of his ass to stop being such a useless, dumb fucking drunk and to grow up and just be a goddamn man already, boy. I love you so much, but come on. Like, what the fuck are you doing? Like, Gawain is a real failure to launch in this movie. Uh, we open up on this shot. I love the opening shot. That's um, it kind of lingers a while on this scene of like a backyard with like a horse and, a, and some chickens and a, and a swan or something like that. And you got this burning building in the background. And then this this guy comes and he he retrieves a sword from his horse and he goes like marching off towards this burning building in the background. And you think that the camera should be following him. This is a chivalric moment. And then the camera pulls back through this window down to the drip, drip, drip of the water, onto Gawain's slumbering face, and whoosh! Splash with water. Christ is risen, his girlfriend says. So right from the beginning, he's uh, he's sleeping in late on Christmas. He went about drinking and, and banging on Christmas Eve. Uh, showed up late home. Been gone all night. His mom's like, hey, where have you been? What have you been doing? Probably already knows what's going on. And I honestly think that his mom was just kind of tired of it. It was like, look, you're going to fucking grow up one way or another. And if I've got to put you through this incredibly contrived and grueling quest in the process, then so fucking be it. You got to grow up some point or another, boy. And so a year comes and goes and Gawain has to set out on the road and set out he does. And the middle part of Gawain's journey uh, his journey from Camelot to the Green Chapel is largely kind of just skipped over in the original poem. They're like, ah, yeah, he saw a dragon, he did some stuff, he saved some people, blah, blah, blah. Now we're going to get to the end of the story. Uh, and this film really drags out that middle section. This was the part that I was originally most interested in when I came in to watch the film because I was like, okay, that original story is pretty short. You could probably do that like in a Twilight Zone-like style of, TV show, you could probably do the original story if he told it straight in like an hour or less. So I'm like, how are they going to fill two hours and 15 minutes of runtime? Well, they do it with a lot of very striking imagery and they do it with uh, some very surreal and trippy sequences. And really everything that happens along the way is in some way or another, like the end of the film, a test of Gawain's virtue. Uh, as a man and as a knight. And all along the way, he has these different encounters that are, are meant to test, like, different aspects of himself. Uh, and the first uh, test is, like, supposed to be an act of kindness, which he fails. And, and Gawain fails most of the tests he faces uh, throughout the film. He first fails a test with the scavenger, uh, whose two brothers had died at the hands of Arthur's knights. Uh, again, that kind of through line of the the kind of inherent hypocrisy of knighthood, of, of being, like, upstanding and virtuous, while also at the same time causing death and destruction, like I said, is something that overrides the entire film and is done quite gracefully. Uh, and Gawain is left for dead. Also, the other change that I thought was so interesting, I'm, I'm kind of jumping around a little bit here, remember, this is the train wreck review, uh, is that in the original story, uh, the sash that Gawain's mother gives him at the beginning of the film is not given to Gawain until the end of the film. Uh, and it's interesting that it's like supposed to be his mother's protection and there's definitely like uh, like a call out to like an umbilical cord. There's a great shot at the end when he's like he's pulling the sash out of like this little hole in his vest and it kind of looks like he's either pulling out his intestines or he's like pulling out an umbilical cord that I think is really supposed to be, like, his link to his mother, you know, in a lot of ways. And in many ways, uh, this film is, like, supposed to be about the proverbial cutting of the cord, him going off and, and learning to be his own man without coasting by on the graces of his mother or his uncle or whoever. Um, and anyway, so early on, he gets captured, fails the test of the act of kindness, uh, and is punished for it. And then he meets that woman in the woods by the lake uh, who's lost her head in the lake. 
And there's that great moment where where she where he kind of like turns back to her and he's like, if I get your head from this lake, what will you give me in return? And her response is just incredulously. She's like, why would you ask me that? Why would you ever ask me that? Not like nothing, you fucking idiot. Just like, why would you even ask me that question in the first place? You're a real fuck up of a night, dude. Uh, and actually, even though he kind of fails there, I still think he succeeds that particular test in the end uh, because he does dive into the lake to retrieve the woman's head, uh, knowing that there's going to be no reward for him in the process. And he, he, he plucks it out of the lake and he puts it back with her body. And I think he does kind of pass that test. And he passes the test of just having enough bravery and determination to even go and meet the Green Knight's challenge in the first place. Um, but really, he's he's struggling with his impending doom and his impending death, uh, which is something that, uh, I mean, I personally have a lot of anxiety about death. I think about it literally every day, which is a really fun and healthy way to live. I would just advise all of you to stress out about death, like, at least a couple times a day. And it'll just really make you feel so warm and fuzzy on the inside if you do it like that. And um, anyway, uh, there's also the great bit with the Giants. The Giants I thought were interesting. I saw the Giants uh, kind of as uh, the, the scene with the Giants is, is as Gawain trying to take the easy way through the journey. Like I almost saw, like there's that shot in the beginning of the film when Arthur asks Gawain, like, you know, to, to look around the court of Camelot, and he asks him, what do you see? And he looks around and he just says, legends. You know, he sees Lancelot and he sees uh, Sir Robin the Brave. No, he doesn't see Sir Robin the Brave. I did think of Monty Python and the Holy Grail at a couple points throughout this movie, though. Um, and uh, he, he says, I you know, he sees legends. So when he, he eats those shrooms in the cave, and then he uh, he sees those giants. I think, one, he's tripping there. And two, I think that's him, like, um, trying to ride off the backs of people who have completed this journey before him. Whether that's the journey of, you know, boy to man, of man to night, of life to death, whatever it is. He, he's trying to... Uh, ride off of the efforts of people who have already made the journey, at, at which point the fox, and I think the fox is actually a projection of his mother. I think a, his mother's hand can be felt throughout this entire journey, kind of like watching him along the way. The fox tells the giants off as though to say, no, he needs to make this journey on his own because really the only way we make that journey, all of us face death alone in the end. Um, and, and nobody else could take us there. We all have to face it by ourselves and we all have to walk that path alone. And so does God. Uh, the really, the most interesting changes come towards the end of the film and the sequence in the Lord and the Lady's Castle, which in the original, uh, story, there is the, the, the game of the exchange of winnings. Uh, and Gawain in the original story resists the woman's advances like she lets him off like she only lets him off with a kiss right but they don't go all the way right uh and gowan gives a kiss to the lord of the castle and doesn't tell him where so uh no dad he, he's not gay he's giving the lord what he what he received at the castle during the day i, I don't think gowan's gay he he i don't know if you know this or not he really likes women it's shown many times throughout i don't think he's gay um, there is a, a wonderful homoerotic undertone to this movie, though. Gotta love it. Uh, anyway, but in this one, he fails that test of, of chastity, and he gives in to temptation. And I don't think it's any coincidence at all that Alicia Vikander uh, plays both Gawain's peasant girlfriend at the beginning of the film and uh, the lady at the castle at the end. Uh, and the presence of the blindfolded woman at the end uh, I think that's pretty clear that that's supposed to be his mother as well, watching him in stern disapproval. Um, because there's only one other character in the entire film that's shown with a blindfold like that, and it's Morgan. Uh, so again, I'm, I'm sure that whole bit at the end there is still a ploy by Gawain's mother to test his virtue. And he fails. Uh, and there's a, it's a great 
great cum shot. Really fantastic cum shot. Yeah, I felt bad. There was a there was a poor little like he couldn't have been more than 14, 15 year old boy in the same row as me at the at the theater. And when he saw the cum, I, I heard him just go, ah. It was fucking hilarious. <laughs> like I said, I, I think I don't think normies are really gonna like this movie. Anyway, um, it's interesting that Gawain fails that test at the end, uh, and that that he really is a, a weak and, and very lustful man. Which is why at the at the end of the film, originally the first time I watched it, I was like, you know, does does Gawain's characterization really even change until like the last 10, 15 minutes of the film? I thought his character was kind of static most of the way through, only to change at the end. And I don't think that's really necessarily the case. I think there is growth along the way. And I think specifically a lot of it comes back to that that beautiful scene with the Lady of the Lake where he's originally determined to just go home at that point. And then when he dives in and he retrieves her head from the bottom of the lake, he finds the resolve to press on and do it. Uh, and I actually appreciated that Gawain was portrayed as a, as a more flawed person than in the original story. Yeah, he's kind of a horn dog. He's greedy and he's a little vain. And, and so are all of us, you know. But in the end, when he gets to the Green Chapel, and he's there, and, um, you know, I just got to say, we're, we'll get into, let's get into some of the religious stuff now. That's the fun, not sticky stuff, right? Um, the end of the film, uh, so I know that um, David Lowry is an atheist. Uh, I know this. I'm not an atheist. Uh, if we were to sit here and talk about my religious and spiritual views, we'd be here all day. I don't really necessarily subscribe to any one religion, uh, and I don't know how literally I believe in a God, so to speak, but I wouldn't consider myself an atheist. We don't really need to go into my own personal views more than that, but I love watching films about life and death and faith and religion and myth uh, from all different kinds of filmmakers, whether they're, you know... Uh, believers or spiritual people like Scorsese, I think makes beautiful films about faith, or if they're kind of in the middle, like Ingmar Bergman, or if they're on the other end, like David Lowry. Like I like watching films from all three of those perspectives. And this definitely comes from the perspective um, of an atheist tackling a, a, a kind of a, a Christian myth that also has this inherent battle with paganism. And I love that bit at the end when Gawain is uh, uh, there with the Green Knight, and first he flinches, which happens in the original poem, and the knight's like, ha, ah, you pussy, and Gawain's like, okay, okay, I'm ready. And then the second time the knight goes to swing, in the original one, I think like the, the knight loses his grip on the second swing or something like that, and he misses, but on the second swing, Gawain pulls back and just looks at the knight and like desperately panicked, just asked, is this all there is? And the knight just looks at him and as though it were the most natural thing in the world, just says, what else ought there be? Like, yeah, this probably is all that there is. You got this world and that's it, you know? And, and I also love the uh, the bit with the lady in the lake earlier in the film when he looks at her and he asks her, he says, are you a person or a spirit? To which she just looks at him and responds, what's the difference? Um... And in that moment, when the Green Knight says to Gawain, you know, what else ought there be? Uh, and then he goes to swing again, and Gawain just gets up and runs away. Honestly, I think that would be most people's reaction in that situation. If you're face-to-face -face with this fucking mythical, like, supernatural or supranatural or paranatural freak of nature knight, and he tells you, this is all there is you're probably going to get up and run the fuck away there. And run, he does. And that whole, like, ten, how, I don't know how long it is, that what if, like, last temptation of Christ sequence at the end of the film, when he rides home and betrays his beloved and loses his son in a battle as his son fights for a chivalric ideal that Gawain himself could not even uphold, and he's saddled with guilt and regret and dies a loathed and hated king and his head falls off as though he knowing that he would still have to make that appointment with destiny regardless of whether or not he were man enough to meet the task now is just mm, magnificent breathtaking cinema 
And when it comes back at the very end, and Gawain, like, takes the belt off, acknowledging, like, as such a morally powerful statement, um, really, of him, like, facing total and complete obliteration and, and knowing that and still deciding to be virtuous in the process without any expectation of any reward or any benefit or any life to come, uh, that is a magnificently powerful statement. And actually, like, is, is a real affirmation of the story of Christ and the story of Christmas, uh, and I think that is beautiful. Like, really, the way he's able to take that, even though Lowry obviously is, I'm, I'm, I doubt that the original author of the original poem was an atheist, uh, considering that it was the 14th century and it wasn't exactly fashionable to be one at the time. Uh, but for him to take that and put it through his own lens and still at the same time kind of uphold the 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 virtues of the of the and the conclusions of the original poem is just a, a master stroke and uh when uh when the green knight leans down and says well done now off with your head you know and then it cuts before you and i, I love that the final shot of the film is at the top of that tree stump or a decapitated tree so it, it kind of does leave it up in the air whether or not gawain actually gets his head cut off at the end I personally choose the interpretation that he doesn't, just because one, I mean, the original story, he doesn't. And two, the fact that this whole thing was engineered by his mother the whole way along, like, I think there's enough, um, there's enough in the film to suggest that you can feel his mother's hand kind of guiding him through this throughout the film, uh, but kind of like letting go at the end and, and letting him become a new man. The, the, the decapitation of the end could be an implied one, a sort of spiritual death so that he can be reborn as a new man, so that maybe Gawain has a chance at the end to rewrite the history uh, for himself that's in place there, uh, or that, that he thinks is in place if he goes home a coward, uh, is really just an exceptional ending. It's one of the best endings to a film I've seen in a really long time. And it was the reason I wanted to see it again, because even though I was muddled on things before, that ending, even the first time through, was so undeniably powerful that I, I just had to see it again to, to make sure that it, it holds up with the rest of the film. And it does. Uh, I think it's a, a, an exceptional ending. And also, I, I like to think that the Green Knight is, is kind of joking there at the end a little bit. Now, off with your head. Like, I think he's being a little cheeky about that or who knows maybe he really does get his head cut off there are two options to this because i do think morgan really kind of authored this whole story in a way um but i think that either one gawain goes home in the end a changed man with a chance to kind of change his life and change who he is and maybe be a better king for it or two uh the darker and more sinister um possible interpretation is that Gawain's mother wanted him to turn back the whole time. I've got good reason to believe that the fox we see throughout the film is a projection of Gawain's mother, uh, specifically because in the scene with the lady in the lake, when Gawain emerges from the lake with her head and he pulls it out of the water, uh, the fox is standing in the exact same spot that the lady at the lake was uh, before Gawain dove in. And at the end, the fox is um, telling Gawain to turn back and to bear his shame and that he will find no mercy there. And this could just be something that's, again, meant to scare him and test him and see if he has the balls to go through with this. Or it could just be his mother telling him, like, look, don't foolishly throw your life away over this ridiculous chivalric ideal that's just a social construct for men to go out and kill each other and, and profit off of this bloodshed. So either Gawain's mother is actually the most brilliant and wonderful mother in the world. And, and also there is that line at the beginning when, when Arthur leans into Gawain and whispers that it's all just a game. You know, that, that kind of makes me think that, again, uh, a lot of this is, is, you know, I think Gawain survives at the end. But if he doesn't survive at the end, uh, that opens itself up to a, a potentially very horrifying implication about his mother. Like, she decided, like, okay, he's not going to be fit to be king. 
Uh, he's not going to be somebody that I can control. So off with your head. I'll just try again with another brat, you dumb little shit. Uh, and I do like that the door is left open just enough there on that you could kind of read into it. I personally am going to take the interpretation that Gawain survives his final encounter with the Green Knight. And the Green Knight's kind of joking with him. Uh, but either way, really a great film. Really gave me a lot to think about. Um, the only real major criticism I have for it at this point, the only major criticism I have really isn't even with the film itself. It's with the film's marketing. Because, uh, look, A24, I love you. I love you guys. You put out a lot of my favorite movies over the last several years. Um, you, I mean, you've put out the Safety Brothers movies. You did Good Time. You did Uncut Gems. You've done Robert Eggers movies. I loved The Lighthouse. I loved The Witch. Um, you put out a lot of great shit over the years. But your marketing is like, I understand that you have to appeal to the normies on some level to get butts in the seats to have any chance of making this thing break even. But I feel like a lot of people's frustrations with the film come from a mismatch in messaging and, and content. If you watch the trailer for The Green Knight, the, the sanitized one that they put out there, it looks like a kind of Lord of the Rings story. Like, oh, look, there's a fox and there's some giants. And oh, my God, look at that knight. He's so big. And, you know, Deb Patel's got a sword. He's touring around. And you think it's going to be this action-packed thing. Really, there's only one, it's only one, <laughs> one fight scene in this whole movie. And it's very short because Gollum just, shing, cuts the, the knight's head off at the beginning, right? Uh, and that's it. And I, I remember the first time I saw this, there were like these four frat bros in the row behind me who uh, were clearly disappointed by the lack of bloodshed in the film and probably about halfway up got up and halfway through got up and stormed out and one of them showed it, fuck this, on his way out, which is like, dude, there are other people here watching the movie, fucking asshats. And also, I, I know a lot of people are going to be confused by this movie. I don't think this is a difficult movie to follow along with. I can see people being a little confused that they're not familiar with the original legend and not understanding that, you know, this is King Arthur and this is Camelot and all that because they never really explicitly say any of that. Um, like Merlin shows up in this movie. Uh, the guy with the eye tattoos. And if you didn't know that, you, you wouldn't know, I guess. But I don't think it's a difficult film to follow along with. Like my father and I both had a, some uh, <clears throat> shiitake uh, mushrooms before we went to see this. We're, we're a big fan of, uh, of mushrooms with our steaks. Uh, and even though we were in a very special state of mind, I can tell you, I mean, and, and look, if you can experience this thing on some very special mushrooms, uh, you should. You should. That's the way to watch this thing. Blew my mind the second time through watching it with that. And maybe that helped me connect with it more on a spiritual level as well. But even my father, who, um, I mean, politically is like completely diametrically opposed to me even he like he watched it he's like this wasn't a difficult movie to follow along with it was a lot for him to process i think he mostly ended up enjoying it but like another person i went with was just like i didn't get it and and i i don't think this is a difficult movie to follow along with but i i do think people will have a hard time following along with it because it's not written in the typical like blockbuster style where everything's just like spelled out explicitly where the subtext just becomes text and there's no room for interpretation or, or discovery or understanding, which I think ultimately cheapens films when you when you don't let the audience discover those things. It's, it's like Kubrick said, you know, if you let somebody discover the meaning of a film, it'll be much more powerful for them that way. And, and this film really leans into that. But the marketing makes it seem like a film that's going to be more in that like typical fantasy style, and it's absolutely not. And I don't think it's any coincidence that you've got like a 50% Rotten Tomato score. Not that that means anything, because most people suck anyway. But um, I do feel like, a, I mean, I feel like there's got to be a better compromise here than, than what's going on, where you're just like, and, and I'm happy that those four frat bros at my first screening, like, uh, unwittingly gave their money to this weird auteur-driven uh, surreal, trippy movie as opposed to like going and seeing fucking Jungle Cruise or something. Um, but I do feel like there's got to be a better way to market this stuff that's like more truthful to what the film actually is while, 
you know, piquing the interest of people who may not necessarily want to see this kind of movie in the first place. Um, or maybe art is dead and culture is dying and we're all fucked. But I said we're going to be positive on this channel and I am very positive about this movie. I fucking loved this thing. I'm going to watch this again many, many times. I want to live in the atmosphere of this film so much. It is so, so, so breathtakingly beautiful. I kind of want to see it again. Uh, honestly, this was the only film this year that I was really actively looking forward to other than Dune. Dune's going to be fucking dope. Um, but yeah, The Green Knight 2021. I loved it. Meant a lot to me. Um, and, uh, I think, uh, David Lowry is a, a director that I'm really interested to see more of his stuff. I'll have to check out a couple of his other films. I've been meaning to see Ghost Story for a while now. Uh, some people, like, love that film. Some people think it's really pretentious and hate it. And, you know, I don't mind things being a little bit pretentious as long as I feel like they've got something interesting to say or, or as long as they're going to get a reaction or a feeling out of me that maybe I haven't felt in a while. So, uh, Anyway, if you want something trippy, you'll want something weird. You'll want something where a guy goes on a literal shrooms trip in the middle of it and sees giants and a, and a, and and talks to a fox and 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 comes on a belt. Uh, you're gonna have uh, you're gonna have a good time with this. If you want uh, a typical fantasy hack and slash, this is not that at all. You will be sorely disappointed. Uh, I've been Richard. I've been train wreck. I still am a train wreck. Thank you very much for joining me today. If you managed to watch all the way to the end, uh, I don't have any prizes for you. But uh, thank you for indulging me if you actually did make it this far. And uh, I love you, dear viewer, and I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful day. Bye.